Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and Alan Watts would be extremely influenced by her teachings. Through the writings of David Neal, the idea of the tulpa, an animated thought form that takes on an autonomous existence, entered the vocabulary of Western esotericism and eventually that of popular culture. Related to the word tulpa is a more common idea among the schools of Tibetan Buddhism, that of tolku. Both tulpa and tolku are related to the idea of the mind being able to create a thought form, an idea that can gain a certain amount of functional vitality and longevity for a specific purpose. Tolku and Tulpa, The Power of the Mind in Action. As Alexandra David Neal wrote in Magic and Mystery in Tibet, the power of producing magic formations, tulkus, or less lasting and materialized tulpas, does not, however, belong exclusively to such mystic exalted beings. Any human, divine or demonic being, may be possessed of it. The only difference comes from the degree of power, and this depends on the strength of the concentration and the qualities of the mind itself. Possibly the single greatest contribution in all of David Neal's writings is the idea of the tulpa's ability to develop a mind of its own. She writes, Once the tulpa is endowed with enough vitality to be capable of playing the part of a real being, it tends to free itself from its maker's control. This, say, Tibetan occultist, happens nearly mechanically, just as a child, when his body is complete and able to live apart, leaves its mother's womb. Yet while David Neal claimed to have created a tulpa fashioned in the image of a jolly medieval monk, a creation that later developed a life of its own and had to be destroyed, she also raised the possibility that her experience was illusory. I may have created my own hallucination, she writes although she also reports that others could see the visualized monk as well. In the secret oral teachings in Tibetan Buddhist sects, David Neal further elaborates on the difference between the terms tulpa and tulku. The Tibetans distinguish between tulkus and tulpas. Tulpas are more or less ephemeral creations, which may take different forms, man, animal, tree, rock, etc., at the will of the magician who created them and behave like the being whose form they appear to have. These tulpas coexist with their creator, and can be seen simultaneously with him. In some cases, they may survive him, or, during his life, free themselves from his domination and attain a certain independence. The tolku, on the contrary, is the incarnation of a lasting energy, directed by an individual, with the object of continuing a given kind of activity after his death. The Tibetan Dubtobs, and here we have the author's note, he who has succeeded, who has accomplished, this implies who has acquired a supernatural power, or siddhas in Sanskrit, are considered to be experts in the art of creating tulpas. Here again we have the author's note. The belief in tulpas is universal in Tibet, and there are many stories about them, some of these stories being terribly tragic, imaginary forms which are a sort of robot which they control as they wish, but which sometimes manage to acquire some kind of autonomous personality. It is also stated that during their periods of deep meditation, the initiates surround themselves with an impassable occult protective zone, extending right around their hermitage when they adopt the life of an anchorite. Novices who are training themselves according to the methods of the secret teachings are sometimes advised to exercise themselves in creating mentally around themselves an environment completely different from that which is considered real. For example, a forest. The usefulness is to lead the novice to understand the superficial nature of the sensations and perceptions. The relative world is close to the imaginary world because, as has been said, error and illusion dominate it. Most of humanity is unconscious of the fact that they live and move in a world of phantasmagoria. In her book, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, David Neal recounts a conversation she had with a lama about the subjectivity of thought forms. When David Neal expressed the notion that those who died during various rites died from fear, and the visions were of their own imagination, the lama to whom she expressed these thoughts replied, According to that, it must follow that a man who does not believe in the existence of tigers may feel confident that none of them would ever hurt him if they were confronted by such a beast. Visualizing mental formations, either voluntary or not,